Africa is often spoken about as a land of untapped potential, rich in minerals, culture, sunlight, and brilliance. But very few have ever figured out how to truly unlock that potential. Until now, one man once dismissed as just another dreamer from Zimbabwe may have found a code, not just to create inventions, but to tap into Africa's hidden wealth. His name? Maxwell Chikambutso. And these are the five astonishing things he did that changed everything. He solved a local problem before going global. Before chasing global headlines, Maxwell looked inward, not at Wall Street or Silicon Valley, but at the power outages crippling his own neighborhood. While others waited on foreign aid or unstable grids, he built a self-powered generator in his backyard. This wasn't just a gadget. It was a message. Africa didn't need to import progress. It could invent it. That invention became the seed of something bigger, a philosophy of solving for Africa first. He rejected the traditional energy industry. While global corporations poured billions into coal, gas, and lithium mining, Maxwell did something radical. He walked away from it all and started experimenting with clean, wireless, and off-grid energy. He wasn't just trying to make electricity. He was trying to make Africa energy independent. The result? His green power machine could power homes without solar panels, batteries, or fossil fuels, creating what some engineers still believe is impossible. But to Maxwell, it wasn't about physics. It was about freedom. He turned rejection into leverage. When Maxwell first demonstrated his inventions, Western media ignored him. Investors laughed. Universities refused to even test his devices. But Maxwell, he saw it as leverage. He took rejection and used it as proof. Proof that he didn't need validation from the West to move forward. Instead, he went to Africa's youth, mentoring a new generation of engineers, building labs in underserved areas, and turning villages into innovation hubs. He knew Africa's true wealth wasn't just minerals. It was mines. He partnered with the continent, not just countries. Where others chased deals with governments, Maxwell chased something else, Pan-African collaboration. He believed no single country could rise alone, but an interconnected Africa could dominate every tech industry from electric transport to off-grid infrastructure. He toured schools in Ghana, held forums in Nigeria, partnered with engineers in Kenya, and began testing his inventions across multiple ecosystems. This wasn't just business, it was movement. And in the process, he tapped into something global investors miss entirely, continental momentum. He let Africa own the narrative. Maxwell realized something crucial. The West always wants to frame Africa's stories. But he didn't want to be Africa's Elon Musk. He wanted to be Maxwell Chikambutso on his own terms. So he stopped seeking approval. He opened his labs to African journalists, hosted free expos for the public, and made his breakthroughs accessible not to billionaires, but to villagers. And the result? A new wave of trust, support, and belief in the African people. The true engine behind Africa's wealth. He open-sourced a piece of the future. In a world ruled by patents, lawsuits, and billion-dollar gatekeeping, Maxwell did something nobody expected. He opened one of his device schematics to the public, quietly, without a press conference. It wasn't his most powerful model, but it was enough to spark a fire. Young tinkerers from Ethiopia to Senegal began building modified versions. Some added their own upgrades. Others formed local startups. Maxwell wasn't just creating products anymore. He was creating an ecosystem. He knew if just one African child could replicate his concept, the continent would never be the same again. He quietly built a communications network. While the media obsessed over electric vehicles and self-powered homes, Maxwell was working on something far more ambitious, something almost no one noticed, a wireless, decentralized, off-grid communication mesh, powered by the same energy systems his devices ran on. No towers. No satellites. Just peer-to-peer, -peer encrypted data, controlled entirely from within Africa. Why? Because in Maxwell's vision... Information was the next frontier of wealth. If Africa could own its data pipelines, it could control everything from digital finance to AI development. This wasn't just disruption, this was sovereignty. He invested in regenerative land projects. Unlike the typical tech entrepreneur chasing concrete and steel, Maxwell turned to soil. 
With profits from his early devices, he bought degraded farmland, not to build factories, but to restore ecosystems. He used smart water harvesting, microbial soil restoration, and autonomous farming drones to heal land once thought dead. He wasn't just feeding people. He was reversing desertification, all while generating data for future climate tech. Africa's wealth, he believed, was buried beneath its feet, and technology could help dig it back up sustainably. He trained his own AI in African languages. Silicon Valley speaks English, Chinese, and code. But Maxwell's labs? They speak Shona, Yoruba, Swahili, Amharic, because he saw what others ignored. Africa's languages carry a different logic, a wisdom that Western algorithms can't understand. So he created a lightweight AI engine trained specifically on local dialects, traditions, and needs, enabling rural communities to interact with tech on their own terms. It wasn't just about access. It was about dignity. He made wealth a shared outcome. Here's the twist. Maxwell never aimed to become the richest man in Africa. His blueprint didn't include billion-dollar IPOs or flashy stock tickers. Instead, his companies were structured like cooperatives. Locals were not just workers, but stakeholders. The wealthy unlocked? It flowed horizontally. Into schools, into solar villages, into shared micromanufacturing units that could produce parts anywhere. In Maxwell's world, wealth wasn't money. It was mobility, energy, knowledge, autonomy. The Internet Liberation Project, tucked away in a low-profile facility surrounded by baobab trees and guarded by silence, Maxwell's next project was not device. It was an idea so radical that even his closest collaborators doubted it would work. The concept? A completely sovereign, Africa-based Internet infrastructure. No reliance on undersea cable control by foreign entities. No satellites leased from multinationals. And no compromise on freedom of speech, privacy, or data ownership. He was developing a constellation of low-orbit nano-satellites, powered by his own wireless energy system. These would beam high-speed Internet to ground stations manufactured locally in Africa using recycled tech waste. Each node was peer-owned. Every transmission encrypted. It was the birth of a truly decentralized digital Africa and the gateway to unlocking massive digital wealth previously siphoned out of the continent. He rewired the African narrative. Perhaps his most revolutionary move wasn't technological at all. It was cultural. Maxwell began funding independent African documentary studios, VR labs, and educational media centers, giving young creators the tools to tell their stories. Not through a Western lens, but through the raw, poetic language of their own truth. Animated films about ancient African engineers. Immersive VR about lost civilizations. A reawakening that shook even the most skeptical historians. Because Maxwell knew, to truly tap into Africa's wealth, the world must first understand that Africa was never poor. It was misunderstood. He built the first self-sustaining energy city, deep in rural Malawi. Where dusty roads once defined the landscape, Maxwell built a city like no other. No power lines. No fossil fuels. Just buildings pulsing with silent energy, drawn from atmospheric waves, stored in non-toxic solid-state units, and distributed on a smart microgrid. The city operated independently from any central power authority. Water was pulled from humidity. Waste was vapor composted and fed into bioreactors. Even the traffic lights communicated using Maxwell's wireless protocols. He didn't wait for governments to go green. He built the future himself. And when engineers from MIT in Japan visited the site, they were speechless. He standardized a new engineering language. To scale his inventions, Maxwell needed more than factories. He needed people who could build like him. So he created Chikumbutso Code, an open-source blueprinting language that used modular symbols instead of words, allowing even illiterate or non-English speakers to understand complex designs. From school kids in Kenya to retired technicians in Namibia, tens of thousands began building devices from diagrams that looked more like musical scores and engineering charts. He turned creativity into infrastructure and infrastructure into equity. He rejected the World Bank's offer. Perhaps the boldest move of all came when Maxwell received a confidential offer. A multi-billion dollar proposal from an international financial consortium. The catch? He'd have to relocate operations 
sign over majority control, and pivot development toward Western markets first. His answer? A single, silent walkout from the meeting. Because for Maxwell, Africa wasn't a market to be extracted. It was a future to be nurtured. And every step he took was approved. The continent already had enough. It just needed permission to believe. The final move, Africa goes global. It was during the Global Future Tech Summit in Geneva, where the world's most powerful innovators gathered to shape the next decade, that the unexpected happened. While billionaires presented their latest AI breakthroughs and space ventures on stage, a subtle interruption flickered onto every screen in the auditorium. No one had hacked the system, but someone had outsmarted it. A live feed appeared. There stood Maxwell Chikambutso in a sunlit courtyard in Harare. Behind him, a school full of children learning to build wireless transmitters, electric drones, and energy harvesting fabrics. He wasn't attending the summit because he was already living the future. In that three-minute broadcast, Maxwell didn't ask for funding or fame. He simply said, We no longer seek permission to lead. Africa is no longer waiting. We are already moving. The crowd went silent. And just like that, the summit's theme, Inventing Tomorrow, no longer belonged to the West. The legacy begins. Maxwell Chikambutso had done more than invent technology. He had engineered a cultural shift, a psychological awakening. Young Africans no longer dreamed of leaving. They dreamed of building right where they were, by tapping into Africa's massive wealth. Not just the minerals or land, but imagination, resilience, and ancestral genius. Maxwell didn't just unlock innovation. He unlocked destiny. And in doing so, he didn't change Africa to fit the world. He began to change the world to fit Africa.